All right. Hello, everyone. So I'm Filippo. This is George. We work on the Cloudflare cryptography team. Alex, who wrote most of the code, is around here somewhere. Um, now, we're here to talk about how to solve the Cloudflare captures. Now, to solve the Cloudflare captures, you click the boxes with the street signs. You have to be careful not to click the boxes with the pole at the base or any other sign that might be in the picture. All clear? Good. OK. Well, then I'm done. <laughs> OK, but seriously, we're talking about solving the problem of the Cloudflare captures. Um, and in fact, while captures like that may seem pretty straightforward, uh, they embed a lot of assumptions about who you are as a person, like um, what language you're familiar with, uh, whether or not you can see or hear clearly, if it's easy for you to type or click all those little squares, uh, or even stuff like where you grew up and how that affects your idea of, of, of what counts as a house uh, or what a storefront might be. So there are a lot of reasons why uh, a capture that seems straightforward might actually be pretty difficult for someone. So at Cloudflare, we try to use them only as a last resort. But what am I even talking about? Uh, let's take a step back for a minute and answer a question that some of you might be asking, which is, what's a Cloudflare? <laughs> uh, Cloudflare is a, a service that sits in front of uh, websites on the internet and provides sort of uh, like value-added request routing. Uh, we try to protect our customers from, from like big obvious threats like DDoS attacks, but also from uh, smaller things like uh, web scraping or comment spam. And we do this by inspecting signals that we extract from the requests that uh, users send through us, uh, looking at things like what resource they're requesting or what browser they're using, what country they're from, um, to try and make a determination about whether or not this is a, like a real human using a website who we should obviously let through, or if it's some kind of bot that's attacking one of our customers, which we should obviously restrict. And generally, we don't have a problem with this. Uh, we can look at all of these traits of requests and make our decision pretty easily. But in one particularly notable case, we have almost none of the signals that we normally operate on uh, to, to go on. And that is uh, Tor Browser. And Tor Browser, in addition to sending all of its users traffic through Tor, also takes a lot of additional security measures to protect the anonymity of its users, which means that all of the things we would normally look at are either deliberately obscured or outright denied to us. So when we still need to make a decision about requests that are coming from Tor Browser, where everyone looks pretty much the same and is coming over Tor, we have to fall back to a lot broader and less precise sorts of signals. And in the case of Tor Browser, the main one that matters is IP reputation. And again, because it's Tor Browser, what I mean here really is the IP reputation of the Tor exit relays. And as you can imagine, uh, they're not great. Uh, it's mostly because enough attackers do use Tor that uh, our automated systems that watch for attacks and then like downrate the, uh, the IPs that we see them coming from uh, automatically assign bad ratings to most of the Tor exit relays most of the time. And when we have only IP reputation to go on, when we can only see that like, oh, hey, this request is coming from one of those sketchy IPs, uh, we have to assume that that traffic might be malicious, and we serve a CAPTCHA to try and disambiguate. Unfortunately, this has side effects. <laughs> and the one that we are really here to deal with today is that Tor users end up getting a lot of Cloudflare CAPTCHAs because we sit in front of so many different websites that it's actually pretty easy to imagine that someone using Tor Browser might have to solve a CAPTCHA of ours for not just every website they visit in a given day, uh, but also possibly several times over again for the same site. And it adds up to you know, easily dozens and dozens of those street sign things every day. And let me tell you, uh, Tor users love us for this. Those, those stickers are so popular, it took me four days of CCC to find any. 
but things actually aren't as bad as they were when the stickers were designed. As you can see from this extremely helpful scale-free chart, uh, <laughs> we're letting through more non-malicious Tor requests now than we ever have previously. But at the end of the day, uh, what we care about is that yellow bar of users who st of traffic that still gets challenged, because some of it is actually users. They're real people who are just using Tor Browser to try to browse the web privately. And while we do want to block the attacks that come through Tor, we don't actually want to block those people. Uh, in fact, we consider it to be an enormous problem. Such an enormous problem that we've tried about half a dozen things internally to uh, solve it, to make it so that this doesn't happen to Tor users. But none of these things have actually addressed the core issue, which is that not so much that you need to solve a CAPTCHA at all ever, but that you end up getting so many of them over the course of a Tor browsing session. So what we really need, what we would really like, is some sort of portable proof of humanness that a, a user of Tor browser can carry around with them and use to bypass the, the CAPTCHA challenges without de-anonymizing themselves and without compromising the security of the Cloudflare Edge. So we're, we're having to meet a sort of union set of security requirements here where it's both the guarantees we make to our customers and the guarantees that Tor Browser makes to its users to protect their anonymity. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so we've actually been working on this for like almost a year and a half now, and the crypto team at Cloudflare knew that we needed to do something about this, uh, but we couldn't figure out what until about a year ago when we read a blog post uh, in which Jan suggested that you could probably rate limit accounts in an anonymous manner using blind signatures. Which, by the way, is why you should all be blogging your obvious crypto ideas. Uh, because we hadn't thought of this, but uh, when we read this post, uh, we said, well, that sounds cool. Uh, why don't we build something like that? And what it's ended up is, is being this. It's a plugin for the Tor browser and a signing service that runs on our network edge such that a user can solve a CAPTCHA and then, along with that solution, submit a whole bunch of blinded tokens. And we'll validate the CAPTCHA, uh, the CAPTCHA solution and then sign the blinded tokens and return them to the user, uh, who can keep them stored in their browser, and the next time they would hit a CAPTCHA challenge, they can instead unblind a token and submit it uh, as a validation so that they don't have to do the street sign thing again. And this actually gets us a lot of the properties that we wanted. It means that the Tor browser user who was previously having to solve possibly dozens of CAPTCHAs per browsing session can instead now solve one hold a bunch of tokens, and uh, not see a CAPTCHA again for the next many websites that they visit. And because of the blinding, we can do this without compromising Tor's anonymity guarantees. And because they are tokens uh, stored in a plugin and not actually cookies, it means that they'll work across domains and uh, over multiple Tor circuits, which our current cookie-based solution just doesn't. But finding a thing that did all of this and still met all of our security requirements was pretty hard. Uh, there are not a lot of options out there. So where we're at with it is uh, straight up boring old best of the 80s blind RSA uh, with a couple of design tweaks that make it more suitable for the HTTP use case. And we've spec'd this out and we have uh, some code deployed that does it. I'll give you this link again in a minute. But in practice, uh, we would really like to get away from this. We've looked at a bunch of other blind signature algorithms uh, and even some full-on anonymous credentials, but in practice, none of them are really deployable. They're either uh, a thing that has just never been implemented anywhere by anyone, or they require some sort of esoteric primitive like pairings, which makes it hard for us to implement it in JavaScript and deploy it in a browser. But Aside from the algorithm itself, there are also some open questions about protocols of this kind in general, such as, well, okay, is this just a whole new de-anonymization vector? Or what do we do about botnets trying to stockpile tokens or uh, 
a malicious website that wants to force a user of Tor Browser to drain uh, their own stash of tokens. And it's the questions like this about the like the proper algorithm and analysis of the protocol where all of you come in, because the point of giving this introductory talk to a room full of cryptographers uh, is that we really need help. Uh, if you have questions, we're here. Uh, if you have comments, there's a mailing list at torproject.org that you can send them to. If you're sitting here thinking, oh no, that's total crap, there's no way it will ever work, uh, hang on, let me show you. The next pets deadline is in February. Uh, and this is all on GitHub, so if you prefer to just give us code or comments or pull requests or anything like that, uh, we're there as well. And that's what I've got, thank you. What's wrong with the RSA solution? Oh my God, all right. Um, <laughs> so, um, aside from the obvious concern that there are just a bunch of gotchas in like doing these large blinding operations in JavaScript, um, which I think we actually do have reasonably good answers about, the main problem with that is that uh, any policy that you want bound to these tokens needs to be bound to the public key that's used to sign them. So if we want to have them expire, if we want to have them only valid for like a certain subset of customers or anything like that, we have to do that with key management. Uh, and as you may have heard earlier, we don't have like a lot of shared state going on in our edge. We'd like to avoid having to have shared state of like every different tranche of RSA key that we can possibly think of a use for. So something that doesn't have this uh, expectation of policy as key management would be much better operationally for us. Uh, it, would it be possible to add language selection to some of these things? I do who is lookups in various TLDs, and they usually end up having to figure out what the picture is asking me for in Swedish, which is not my language, <laughs> and uh, it's a big problem for me anyway. So uh, for that, you'd have to talk to Google. <laughs> Are your customers happy about this? Because I'd imagine a lot of your customers rely, business models rely on knowing as much as possible about their users, and essentially you're now making it easier for users to access those services anonymously. That's a good question uh, that I don't have a like, really 100% correct answer for. Mostly, we already give people the ability to uh, apply customer-specific policy to Tor traffic. So if you've gone ahead and done something like that, like if you really don't want anonymous users, uh, you can already make life harder for them. But if you haven't done that, it probably means that you don't care, and we shouldn't be uh, making it harder by default. I was wondering what type of attacks are you trying to prevent from Tor users that you will actually still prevent using this system? Because it can't be DDoS attacks, right? Tor is not suitable for DDoS attacks. Yeah, so uh, that's actually an interesting answer that I've got for this. Uh, the type of, uh, when, when you actually look at the type of uh, traffic that we see coming over Tor that our customers don't want to receive, it's not, like, by volume, it's really not like what you would think about, like, exploits or elite Russian hackers. It's more like uh, comment spam and, uh, like, high bandwidth web scraping that just has no concept of rate limiting and will take down your site without thinking about it. And those sorts of things do come over Tor. Uh, and then there's this long tail of weirdness, like, um, SQL map literally has a dash dash Tor flag uh, that, will, that will just route all of your traffic through Tor while you're trying to do SQL injection attacks. So it's, it's stuff like that. I wasn't, I wasn't aware that Cloudflare was in the business of scrubbing the content of the customers that they receive as well. I'm sorry, could you repeat? I, I wasn't aware that Cloudflare is also in the business of scrubbing the content that their customers receive. Um, content, not really. Um, 
Oh, the requests. Uh, yeah, so basically, we don't, we don't check for content so much as like form that indicates it's coming from a Russian botnet or something like that. Yeah, that we have a box. Yeah, we, we, basically what I'm talking about is a WAF. We have a WAF. Mm -hmm. So uh, early on when there was all of, like I guess this time, la or this time last year, or maybe even the year, but no, the year before, sometime in 2000, yeah, the year before I think, um, you guys published some graphs about the, which, about sort of, sort of um, the rate at which uh, the Tor exits were being blocked or whatever. And of course I don't, I don't know anything about where, you guys didn't publish sort of the methodology behind them and things like this. But there was, when I, just sort of guessing the methodology and backing out and doing some little back of the envelope computations, it looked like you guys found, it looked like you guys were seeing two bad Tor circuits on average uh, sort of continuously. So it, it seemed a bit to me like the actual culprit, there were actually not very many culprits behind this, literally two on average. So uh, unfortunately, I really have no idea about that. Um, yeah, perhaps sure. you do? Sure. Um, yeah. Is this on? Yeah. So mm, I think th those graphs were generated early on. Uh, we, mm, the ones you've seen on the slides have used a different methodology. But uh, more relevantly, I think that even if it's just two on average at any time, well, the nature of Tor is that we have no way of identifying them. So again, if we deploy counters measures against those, we end up hitting users also. So hence this talk. What I meant by that is there might have been, I mean, did you guys try, for example, uh, rotating very quickly? So for example, the circuit is 10 minutes. So it, there are things like rotating very, do, doing the detection, whatever metrics you're doing for detection, um, using, having a very fast version. Oh, I guess you can't do that because you have, it has to run over a long period of time, right? Okay, yep. never mind. All right, is, is it gonna be quick? Yes. Excellent, Hi. go for it. This is very innovative, thank you. It, one of the bits of trying to be anonymous, as I understand it, is looking like everybody else who's using Tor. And so if other companies that want to do something similar, but you know, a little bit different, take your open source code and do the, the uh, Facebook challenge bypass specification, or even other CDNs might imagine approaching something like this, um, it seems like you get a bit or so of de-anonymization per plugin like this that becomes popular in the world. And not just for those who've installed it, of course, but for those who choose not to install it, then they stand out as being weird in that way. So to be safe and to really meet that anonymization goal, maybe I'm missing something and just everybody can, can, can use the one that you've got. And so there's one plugin and you get it upstreamed into Tor and you're good. If so, are you pursuing that? Pull request welcome, that, that sort of thing? So uh, short answer, yes. Uh, longer answer is, uh, this is in no way Cloudflare specific. Um, it's the way the plugin and the tags on websites and stuff are architected present you with a list of public keys. And if you, uh, and if you have one of those pinned in your plugin, or many of them even, that's what decides which uh, requests for tokens that you respond to. But which keys you have pinned is detectable, so you still get a bit per key that's pinned. So. I guess it's to, to, to make this safe, there has to be one master key and one entity has to hold it. I mean, you know who I propose. I, who, who do you propose? Talk to you later. <laughs> All right. <laughs> All right, why don't we take the rest, uh, well, uh, let's take it offline. Thank you and thank everyone. Yeah. Thank you.